Welcome back to Chapter 5. Section 5.2, one-to-one functions and inverse functions. We're going to determine whether a function is one-to-one, -one, determine the inverse function of a map or a set of ordered pairs, obtain the graph of an inverse function from the graph of a function, and find the inverse of a function. So let's get started. Let's start out with a definition of a one-to-one -one function. Now, this little gobbledygook is what your book says, but basically, for f of x to be a one-to-one -one function, each x corresponds to exactly one y, and each y corresponds to exactly one x. So if we look at this first picture, this is a one-to-one -one function, because you see x1 goes to y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on. The next one is not one-to-one -one function, and that's because x1 and x2 go to y1. And finally, remember this is not a function at all, because x1 goes to y1 and y2 at the same time. A really easy way to determine if a function is one-to-one -one is looking at the horizontal line test. And basically what that says is this graph, this function in blue, if you draw a horizontal line and it touches that function anywhere twice, that is not one-to-one. -one. And the reason is, remember, x1 and x2 go to the same y value, so that's not a one-to-one -one function. So let's take a second and just define the difference between the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. The vertical line test only tells us if the graph is a function. The horizontal line test tells us that the function is one-to-one. -one. If we have a vertical and horizontal line test that are both true, that means that this is a one-to-one -one function, but also that the inverse of that one-to-one -one function is also a function. And we're going to talk about inverses in just a minute. Now it's important to remember that one-to-one -one functions have an inverse but not all are functions. Let's look at these two graphs of functions. So let's look at f of x equals 3y. And this is what it'll look on your graph. Now notice, if I draw a horizontal line anywhere on this graph, it only touches once. So that tells me that this is a one-to-one -one function. Interestingly enough, if I draw a vertical line, it only touches once. So that tells me that this is not only a one-to-one -one function, but the inverse of this function is also a function. Slightly confusing, but let's just continue here for a second and I'll show you. So let's look at this graph. Once again, if I draw a horizontal line, it only touches the graph once. So this is a one-to-one -one function. Just like the last one, if I drew a vertical line, it only touches the graph once. So this also is a one-to-one -one function with the property that its inverse is also a function. So I've been talking about inverse function, but let me show you exactly what it is. First of all, the notation for an inverse function is f to the negative one of x. This negative one does not mean one over f. It actually tells us it's the inverse function of f. Functions f of x and g of x are inverses of one another if and only if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. Now remember they both have to be true for these two functions to be reverse inverses of each other. And basically the process of finding an inverse is simply the swapping of the x and y coordinates and then solving for y. So let me show you how you do that. So let's find the inverses using algebra. So the first thing we're going to do is change f of x to equal y. Then we're going to change the y's and x's and x's to y's. And then we're going to solve for y. So let me show you how easy this is. So the first thing I'm going to do is write f of x as a y. So we have y equals 3x. Then we're going to change the y and x's around. So instead of a y, we're going to have an x. Instead of an x, we're going to have a y. And now we simply solve for y, which means we want to get y by itself. 
So I'm going to divide by 3 on both sides. So y equals x over 3. So now here is my inverse function of f of x. Let's look at the second one here. So once again, I'm going to write y equals 2x minus 3 over x plus 4. Now I'm going to give you a little warning. Don't, sk don't skip through any of these steps. Write them out because I've seen students um, miss one little step and they get the whole problem wrong. So now we are going to change the y's for x's and the x's for y's. Okay, I love to cross multiply. So we're going to cross multiply x times y plus 4 equals 1 times 2y minus 3, which is just 2y minus 3. Now I'm going to distribute. So we have xy plus 4x equals 2y minus 3. Well, I'm running out of room, so we're going to put this guy up here. And so what I'm going to do is I want to get all the y's on one side and everything else on the other side. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 4x from both sides. So I will have xy equals 2y minus 3 minus 4x. Now remember I want to get all the y's on one side, so I'm going to subtract 2y from both sides, so I get x, y, minus 2y equals negative 3 minus 4x. Okay. Now I'm going to um, take out a y. So x minus 2. And I apologize for my tablet. I'm not sure what it's doing, but we can still see it. I'm going to get y by itself, so I have to divide by x minus 2. Don't forget my negative there. And here is the inverse of this function f of x. So let's check the inverse result. And if you look here, this is f of x equals 3x from above, and then this was our inverse. So basically, f of g of x should equal x, and g of f of x should also equal x if these two are truly inverses. So let's do the first one. f of g of x should equal f of g of x, which is x over 3. So now we're going to put this in for our x. So we have 3 times x over 3. And sure enough, the 3's cancel which leaves us with an x. So the first one's true, but remember they both have to be true. So let's look at the next one. So we have g of f of x equals g of f of x, which is 3x. Now remember we're putting this in for x, so that gives us 3x over 3 and look at that. That also reduces to x. So we just proved that these two are truly inverses of each other. 
Let's look at the second function that we found the inverse for. And here's the inverse. Remember it was negative 4x minus 3. I just multiplied through by negative 1 to make it a little bit nicer. And there's something really cool about these graphs. Here's the function f of x. And I just pulled up the table. You can do this on your calculator and it should look exactly the same. And here's the next one. Here's the inverse function. Okay, so this is what your graph should look like for the inverse function. And what's really interesting about these is that here's the table of our original function. And this ordered pair is 0, negative 0.75. On the inverse function, we should find that exact coordinate, except for backwards. We should find it as negative 0.75, 0. So let me show you that. We're going to go into Calc and Value. Now remember this time, if it's the Y value on my original function, it'll be the X value on my inverse function. So negative 0.75. And look at that negative 0.75, 0. Let's try another one. Let's go way down here to 6, comma, 0.9. That would be our ordered pair. That means on our inverse function, the ordered pair should be 0.9, comma, 6. So let's try it. Let's go into calc, value, 0.9, and look at that, 0.96. Finally, let's look at this last picture. So this is both f and inverse f of x graphed with y equals x. Now the inverse function um, can be obtained by reflecting the graph of f about the line y equals x. So this point right here reflects to this point right here. Because remember, if it's 0, negative 0.75 in my original function, it's going to be negative 0 0.750 in my inverse function. Having showed you the graphs, let's find the domain of a composite function. Basically, we're going to find the domain of the inside function, create the composite function, find the domain of the composite function, and finally write the domain. Now it sounds hard, but let me show you how easy it is. So state the domain of the function f o g of x. Now remember, that's the same as f of g of x. So when I talk about the inside function, I'm talking about this guy in here. So if we look at this function, we need to determine the domain. That means we need to take this denominator and make it equal to 0. So 2 minus x equals 0. <clears throat> if I add x to both sides, I have 2 equals x. So what this tells us is the domain equals everything except 2. Now we're going to do the actual composite. So we have f of g of x. Well, this is g of x, so let's put that in there right now. 4x plus 3 over 2 minus x. Okay, now we're going to put this in for every x in the f function. So we're going to have 2 times 4x plus 3 over 2 minus x minus 3. Okay, that's the top because it's 2 with my x value over 4x plus 3 over 2 minus x plus 4. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is, oh, let's distribute this 2 into here. Now remember it's 2 over 1, so I'm just taking 2 times the top. So I end up with 8x plus 6 over 2 minus x minus 3 over 4x plus 3 over 2 minus x plus 4. Okay. 
Now, um, hopefully you remember from college algebra, or regular algebra, that I want to get rid of these denominators, so I'm actually going to multiply by 2 minus x over <clears throat> 2 minus x. Okay, so what's going to happen is that when I do that, these will cancel, but I still have to multiply 3 times this. And here, these will cancel, but I still have to multiply 4 times that. So let me show you what that's going to look like. We're going to have 8x plus 6 minus, and now I'm going to just take negative 3 times 2, okay, is minus 6. Negative 3 times negative x is a positive 3x over 4x plus 3, and then 4 times 2 is a positive 8, and 4 times negative x is negative 4x. Okay. Um, let's put some stuff together. Well, these two are going to cancel, which is really handy. So 8, 9 to 11, we have 11x over 4x minus 4x cancel, which gives us 11. And it turns out to be x. Now, we kind of knew that, right? Because these, we just proved were inverses of each other. But it's still kind of nice to um, go through all of this, you know, gobbledygook, so to speak. And the domain of this one is all, ooh, the domain of, goodness, the domain of x is all real numbers. So we can say the domain of f o g of x is x such that x cannot equal 2. And remember, that's from way up here. So let's state the domain of the function g o f of x. So I have my f of x and g of x. Now remember, this is the same thing as saying g of f of x. So this is my inside function. So if I look at f of x, the domain is all real numbers, so we don't have to worry about that. So let's actually find the composite. So we have g of f of x, which is 2x plus 1. And now we're going to put that into g of x. So we have the square root of x, which is 2x plus 1. Well, we can't simplify any farther th from here, but we know the square root, inside the square root, can never be negative. So it has to be greater than or equal to 0. So that's what we do. 2x plus 1 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. So 2x and negative 1 divide by 2, so x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1 half. And that turns out to be our domain. Our domain is x such that x has to be greater than or equal to, equal to negative 1 half. Okay, so now it's time for you to start the assignment 5.2 homework. Um, be sure to look at the other practice examples. Um, also look at the book if you have any questions. Remember, you can always email me any questions or come on to Skype during office hours.